because I was having a hard time typing on it. What's this? Your keyboard thing? I put it right there. Is that okay? Can I? So go to get onto Rick Ross. Okay, I'll let you do it. Oops, that's the, yeah, the one for the lab. How's it going? Screen on. Can we get the screen on? So how's it going, everyone? My name is Aaron Rosen, and uh, today we're presenting a hands-on lab, basically showing the new features of Neutron that were developed in the Havana release. So 
we have a lab presented, prepared for you guys. So if you can go to this uh, bit.ly link at the bottom, we have a Google Doc set up. Uh, this page, that link will take you to here. And then you can access, uh, you need to go to these two links. And that'll bring you to the, this Excel spreadsheet um, where you'll need to put in your email address to uh, reserve a lab. And then from that, you'll use this IP address to SSH2. Um, so I'll leave this here for a little bit so you guys can get to that page. So it's important to note that these are actual real, lab, real labs that are deployed in our cloud back at VMware. So you want to make sure that you don't pick another one that someone else is using. Otherwise, you're going to run into problems because two people are going to be accessing it at the same time. Say it again. Cool. Has everyone been able to get to there? Reserve a lab. So in order to get into the lab, I'm assuming everyone has a SSH client. If not, you could download something like Putty to use. And the username to get into the lab is uh, Nasira. N-I-C-I-R-A. So basically what you're going to want to do is if you pull up a terminal, During the presentation, if you guys have any questions, we have some helpers here. We have Somic, Eric, Dan, Duffy, Ben, and Salvatore. So if you have any uh, questions, just raise your hand and uh, someone can come over to help you out. Cool. So we're all logged in. Uh, So when you're signing into the Google spreadsheet, make sure just to use your regular uh, Gmail account. But you should be able to access it without any account.
Yep, the user is always going to say It's spelled right here, too, N-I-C-I-R-A. Cool. So if anyone's having any issues, just uh, raise your hand, and we'll keep uh, coming around. Thanks so much. Cool. Well, while we're getting the login issues uh, s settled down, I'll go ahead and just uh, start presenting like what we're going to be trying to do here today. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to deploy a multi-tier application using OpenStack. So what the components that we're going to use to do that is we're going to leverage security groups, which are basically a construct to say what's a, which hosts are allowed to talk to which other hosts. And in this lab, we're going to create a uh, jump host, which I'll talk about more when we go to deploy it, which is basically going to be a host that's the only one that's publicly accessible from the internet. So you're going to be able to use this host. You're going to be able to jump into this host to get to your other hosts. Um, next, we'll deploy a few web servers uh, and a load balancer. And after that, we'll leverage uh, the firewall as a service component that landed in the last release in order to enforce uh, ACLs on the router ports. So here's an overview of what we're going to try to create. We're going to create a logical router that contains a firewall that's uplinked to a public network. Um, this router is also uplinked to a private logical network, which has these three hosts, Web Server 1, Web Server 2, and the jump host. Um, the jump host allows TCP port 22 into it and ICMP, and the web hosts allow TCP port 80 in it in order to serve web traffic, and they also allow the jump host access. So the web servers are not going to be publicly SSHable from the internet. You'll have to reach them from the jump host. So this is just a way to lock down security a little bit more. So what we've prepared for you is this. Uh, this is what the lab topology looks like. When you SSH to that IP address on the sheet, you'll end on this uh, lab jump host, which is connected to the public internet. Um, from there, there are these four uh, nodes that are deployed, uh, Nova Compute, uh, two Nova Compute nodes, those are going to be what are going to be running our virtual machines. An OpenStack controller, which runs all the API endpoints, uh, Nova API, Nova Scheduler, Keystone, Glance, and Neutron. And the network node, which provides DHCP um, and LP, uh, L3 connectivity in addition to the load balancer agent and metadata. Um, just to give you an overview of what all these services are, um, the L2 agent basically provides L2 connectivity between uh, hosts. So one interesting deployment option that Neutron allows you to do is allows you to deploy compute nodes regardless of your physical network. So for instance, in this topology, these two Nova compute nodes are actually on two different L3 uh, subnets. So, and we are able to deploy VMs on top of those compute hosts that are, span that are on top of the same L2 boundary. So this allows you to simplify your deployment. You don't have to worry about trunking VLANs. Um, it's using uh, ST, uh, GRE with overlays. Um, so the interesting thing about this lab is we're deploying this on top, in our cloud on top of the Nasera technology. Um, in this lab, you'll be using the Open uh, vSwitch plugin, which is the open source uh, reference implementation that Neutron provides. So just to give you an overview of how this looks um, as a deployment option. So if you look at one of the labs, as you can see from this slide here, there are, there are several networks. Uh, there's a management network which uh, VMs are managed, that which you basically you just use to administer VMs. Um, there are these two uh, data networks that are connected to your compute host, and then there's this external network that connects from the internet inwards. So this is the landing page of the NVP manager of our production cloud, which we use to dog food our product. So here you can see we have 101 hypervisors, several gateway nodes, which provides uh, L3 access in and out of the cloud. Um, and we have our controller clusters here. Um, so if we look at one of the labs I've pulled up, we can see that uh, here are all the ports that are attached to the VMs. So we have 18 ports in total, and we have eight logical networks. Um, so the two data networks, uh, 
uh, the external network and the management network. Um, this one port here we have marked as down on purpose, and that just allows us to administra administratively take the port down, so this way you guys don't have access into the internal VMware network. So that's why that is down. Cool, so uh, is everyone at a point where they're able to SSH into the jump host? The username is uh, Nasira, N-I-C-I-R-A. So in order to complete this lab, it'll probably be helpful to pull up these instructions alongside so you can uh, copy and paste it into the terminal. So just to give you an overview of what the neutron abstractions are, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a private network. So this is basically accomplished via the neutron net create command. So this creates uh, a layer two broadcast domain. So we'll go ahead and do that now. So when you log into the jump host, the first thing you'll need to do is source the credential file. So basically what this file does is it allows you, it tells you where all the API endpoints are and allows you to run API commands against the OpenStack APIs. So the first thing we'll do is we'll create that layer two broadcast domain via the neutron net create command. One thing I want to point out is uh, uh, in a, what we've already deployed is we've already deployed an uh, external network, which will be internet reachable for your uh, VM. So if you do neutron netlist, you'll see that there's already a public network that's deployed out here. So this is the first step we've done. We've, we've logged into the machine and we've created a uh, private network that we're going to connect our VMs to. The next step after creating that private network is we're going to associate a subnet to it. So basically this... Okay. Is anyone else having issues out there? Anyone else having problems?
Cool. So we've just created a, a layer two broadcast domain. So after doing that, the next step is we're going to associate a subnet to that. So that basically allows us to IP address management for the VMs that are connected to that network. So in order to do that, we'll run this command, neutron subnet create. Um, we'll tell it the, the network that we're uh, creating it on top of and then the sitter that we want to be associated with that network. So right now, what we have deployed is we have a layer two broadcast domain, and then we have a subnet that's associated with that that we'll use to feed IP addresses out to the instances. Cool. So if you're running into this uh, unsupported uh, local locality error, um, there's a command that you'll need to run in the terminal, uh, and that command is export lc all equals c. All right, so our next step is basically going to be uplinking this network to a router. So this way we'll be able to go in and out of the network. So in order, so the next thing you want to do is you want to create a router. So to do that, we'll use Neutron Router Create. So I'll go ahead and do that too. And then after creating the router, we'll need to uplink our, our subnet to that router. So in order to do that, or we'll need to attach the router to our public network. Um, so you can have multiple public networks. So in this case, we'll just have, we only have one public network provided for you. So to do that, you'll run Neutron Router Gateway Set. You'll tell it the router that you want to connect and then the network. So this is what the logical topology looks like right now. We have a router that's uplinked to a public network. Cool. <clears throat> Our next step is going to be attaching that network that we created earlier to that logical router. So this will allow us to, when we attach VMs to this network, to be able to go in and out of the cloud. So in order to do that, we'll run this command here, neutron router interface add. We'll tell it the router and then the subnet that we want to attach to that router.
if anyone needs more time, uh, just raise your hand and I'll wait up a little longer. Uh, can I get a show of hands for anyone who still needs more time? Cool. So the next step that we're going to do in order to deploy this multi-tier application is we're going to start creating security groups and security group rules. So the first security uh, group that we're going to create is going to contain rules for our jump host. So this is going to be a host that's going to be publicly accessible via the internet. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a security group. So basically what this is, is this is just a container to hold rules. So we'll go ahead and run this command uh, to create this container, neutron security group create. And we're going to call the security group jump host that we're going to associate to the jump host. So after we've created that security group, we're going to add these two rules to it. So this first rule allows us to have ICMP be accepted into the VM. So this just helps us debug if, any, if you run into any issues. The second rule that we're going to create will allow uh, TCP port 22 to, to go into the VM. So this allows us to SSH to it. So the next step we're going to take is we're going to launch this uh, jump host. So just to give you a quick overview, I have the command here that does it. Um, but we're going to use the Cirrus image, and we're going to tell it uh, flavor 1. So that's basically the size of the VM. So that's going to have 512 megs of RAM and two VCP or one vCPU. Um, this is the name of the VM. We're just calling it jump host. And these are the security groups that we're going to um, add to that instance. So I've run this command, and if we uh, do Nova list, this will show us the status of the VM while it's booting. So you can see right now, uh, the VM is in build state. One thing to note is we're running this lab in a nested fashion. So we have our physical cloud deployed with hypervisors. And then we have this lab deployed, and now we're going to be deploying VMs on top of that. So there's two layers of virtualization. So it'll be a little bit slow to, to boot these. But. So as you can see here, the VM has eventually went active. Um, it's in running state, and it shows the private IP address that it's, that's added to that instance. So at this point, you can see this VM has this private IP address of 10.0.0.2. Um, at this point, we're not able to access that because that, that IP address is attached to uh, this uh, logical network, and there's no way for us to route in and out of that. So in order to be able to connect to that instance, we're going to need to create a floating IP address and associate it with that instance. Sure. So um, when you launch an instance, if you only have one network, when you launch an instance, by default, it'll attach to uh, one network. So there's only one network that's accessible to the instance, which is the private network. So if you do neutron net list, um, this is the only network that the instance is able to connect to. So by default, it'll automatically attach to that. But if you had multiple networks, you would need to pass um, dash dash nic net dash id and give it the network that you explicitly want to attach the VM to if you had multiple networks.
This makes uh, typing it in a little bit easier. This way you don't have to copy and paste that uh, network ID. So the next step that we want to do is we want to determine the port um, UUID that's associated to that jump host. So this is a little bit tricky to find out. Um, we're going to use this command neutron port list. And we're going to pass it a filter to basically search for the instance ID um, that we just launched. So this will allow us to find uh, all the ports that are attached to this instance. So if you do Nova list, that'll display uh, this output with one VM. You want to copy that ID and paste it into this command. So this shows the port that's attached to the VM. Here's its MAC address, the subnet that it's attached to, and its IP address. Um, I think it's probably still in provisioning state. Um, it should come. Has it still not shown up yet? Hey, Eric. Is anyone stuck still? Still booting? While the VMs are still booting, um, our next step is to associate a floating IP with this instance that we just booted. This will allow us to uh, access the instance publicly. So in order to do that, we use this command neutron floating IP create. Um, we pass it the port ID that we want to associate the IP address with. So using that neutron port list command to determine the port ID, we'll take that and pass it to this. So after running this command, you should be able to ping uh, the floating IP that it returned to. Uh, net dash ID, but you shouldn't need to pass it the network ID. Did I get a show of hands who, for everyone who was able to get to the step? Cool. Looks like we're getting there. Uh, just one thing to mention, um, the lab that you're logged into is just unique to you. It seems like some people have uh, logged into the same lab as other people, um, in which case you're going to stop on each other.
Like, because multiple people will have to create multiple networks and things won't work correctly. Cool. So our next step is we're going to create a security group um, for our web servers. Um, so in order to do this, we'll do the same command before uh, neutron security group create web. Um, these are going to contain the rules um, that dictate what traffic is allowed in and out of our web servers. Um, for our web servers, we're going to allow TCP port 80 into them. So this way, they can be accessible from the internet. So we do that by, uh, with this rule, neutron security group rule create. We're allowing the protocol TCP and the port range uh, uh, between port 80. And we're adding it to the web security group. The next step is we're going to create a security profile rule that allows our jump host to be able to access all of our web hosts. So in order to do that, there's a self-referential rule here that specifies the group ID uh, jump host. So basically, what this means is anyone who's a member of the jump host security group can access the web members of the web security group on protocol uh, TCP port 22. So one nice thing about this, this is you can continue to add more and more web servers. And by default, you'll automatically be able to access them from your jump host. So this way, you don't need to continue adding and removing rules if you add more servers. Can I get a show of hands if everyone's up to this point or who all's up to this point? Cool. So after creating those security profiles and rules, we're going to go ahead and boot two web servers. So this is accomplished via these uh, two commands here. And uh, again, we're going, to we're going to use the flavor one. And uh, each one is going to be called web server one and web server two. And we're going to tell it to use the security group uh, web. After running those commands, you can run Nova list to see the status of the VMs, uh, what state they are. So as you can see, the two VMs on my setup are in building state. Uh, so by default, uh, the direction flag on the, sec on the security group rules allow us to enforce uh, policy ingress and egress. So if you don't specify the direction, the default policy will allow uh, ingress traffic into the VM. So those rules will allow port 22 to come into the VM. Um, we could also um, set up egress ACLs. So basically say the VM is not able to go out on port 22. So if we wanted to prevent an instance from SSHing out to the public internet, we could um, basically, basically have rules to, to do that. And that's controlled via the direction flag. So at this point in my setup, all of my hosts are up. And you can see web server 1 and web server 2 are up with uh, IP address 10.0.0.4 and 10.0.0.5. Yep. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and SSH into that jump host. And from there, we'll be able to jump into uh, Web Server 1 and Web Server 2. So in order to figure out the floating IP address of the jump host, you could run Nova list, and that'll show the public address here. Or you could run Neutron floating IP list. So the username for the image is Cirrus. So you should be able to run this command from the jump host. And then the password is Cubs win with a smiley face. Um, it's right here. So 
So when you get on the jump host, you should be able to ping the two web servers, uh, 10.0.0.4 and 10.0.0.5. And Actually, you shouldn't be able to ping them because uh, the profile rule from the, from the jump host only allows SSH, not ICMP. Um, so you should be able to SSH to them. So the next step is we're going to SSH to both web servers and we're going to spin up a little dummy web server to handle uh, requests. So if you SSH to 10.0.0.4 and the same password, um, and from there we're going to use this... Uh, this little trick in order to spin up a dummy web server that's going to respond the web server name uh, when someone does a GET request on it, on port 80. So after you do that on web server 1, you'll want to type uh, exit, which will bring you back to the jump host, and then you'll want to do the same thing for web server 2. Um, so you'll SSH to 10.0.0.5, uh, type in the password, but this time we'll run uh, this command, which will return web server 2 instead of web server 1. After doing that, uh, you can type exit from that host. And if you run the curl command against each of these hosts, you should see the correct response returned. Web server 1, web server 2. So while everyone's getting up to this point, I'll just talk about what our next step is going to be. So what we're going to do next is we're going to create a load balancer pool. And then we're going to put these hosts in that pool. So basically, when you make a request to the VIP, which is the, the, flip, which is the IP address of the load balancer, it'll go ahead and uh, load balance the request to both of our servers. So we'll make the request to one server. It'll return web server one. And then we'll make the same exact request. And it'll return web server two. And we're just going to use uh, the round robin method um, for now. Cool. So we'll go ahead and uh, create that load balancer pool. We'll have to exit out from the jump host. And after creating the pool, we're going to go ahead and add our two uh, web servers to it. So in order to do that, we're going to use this command, neutron lb member create. We're going to tell it the address of web server 1 and web server 2, and then the, the port that we want it to uh, listen on and keep track of. So you can see uh, we spawn up our web server on port 80, and uh, we're going to be using protocol port 80 here for our pool members. One thing to note is if you uh, accidentally made a mistake or booted multiple VMs, your IP addresses might differ from my IP addresses. 
So in order to figure out the correct IP address for your web servers, if you run the Nova list command, that'll tell you uh, the IP address is here. So in my case, the, the IP addresses are 10.0.0.4 and 10.0.0.5. So I've already added my first pool member to that uh, pool. Uh, web server one, and then I'll go ahead and run the same command, but I'll update the address to be uh, 10.0.0.5. After creating these pools, our next step is we're going to create a, uh, a health monitor. So basically what this does is it'll monitor the health of our instances uh, at a periodic interval. So if one of our instances dies, it'll remove it from the pool and it'll no longer send requests to it. So this allows us to do some kind of uh, HA and scale out mechanisms. So to create the health monitor, we'll use this command, uh, neutron LB monitor create. Um, And then we'll, we're going to go ahead and associate this health monitor with the, the pool that we created earlier. So you'll have to copy this ID from the health monitor. And then you'll have to type my pool. So now you can see we have a health monitor that's associated with that uh, pool. So at this point, we're going to create a uh, virtual IP address for our load balancer. So basically what this does is when requests go to that VIP, they'll be fanned out to our pool members appropriately. So as you can see here, uh, the address 10.0.0.6 was returned to us. So uh, when connections go to that address, they'll get fanned out to our two web servers. Uh, one thing to note is this IP address here is also on our private network. Um, so you, if we look at this uh, topology diagram, uh, this is this uh, VIP IP address right here that's attached to the private network. So at this point, if we make requests to that, we're not going to be able to reach it from the public internet. So the next step is going to be creating a floating IP and associating with that VIP port. So uh, to do that, one thing to note is uh, this is a typo here. This UUID won't actually be the UUID of your lab. Um, so you'll have to make sure to use the correct port ID. Um, so from this, uh, the VIP output, you can see the port ID that's associated with the VIP is displayed right here. So what we'll go ahead and do is we'll uh, copy this uh, ID here and pass it to this command. So now we have a floating IP that associates the internal IP address 10.0.0.6 with uh, its external IP address uh, 172.16.1.5. So when requests are made to the floating IP, they'll be uh, natted to the internal IP. So if everything worked correctly, you should be able to run curl against this IP address and see web server 1 returned and then web server 2 returned.
should automatically come. So the members of the load balancer should come active right away. Um, if yours aren't active, my guess would be that that command that we typed in to start that web server uh, isn't, didn't get run correctly. Because what actually happens is the monitor that we associated will go ahead and uh, poll on, on those instances in order to make sure that they're active. So it's like almost yeah, it should be almost immediate, within three seconds, because uh, that's the delay on the, the monitor. Right. And you'll also have to run that service on port 80 for it to even be active, too, because it does health checking. So can I see a show of hands of people who are able to get this working? Cool, awesome. So the next thing I'm going to demo is I'm going to show the firewall as a service stuff that uh, landed in this release. Um, so this is uh, just a reference implementation. Um, the API for it is probably uh, going to change in the future. Uh, one shortcoming of it is that it's kind of a, it's a global default. So when you create a, a firewall, it's applied to all of your routers, unfortunately, right now. There's no concept of uh, zonage, uh, just to give you a heads up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a firewall policy. Um, and this policy is basically the same thing as a security group. It's a container that you can put rules in it. So we're going to accomplish that by writing a neutron firewall policy create. And then we're just going to call this a default policy. After creating that firewall policy, we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a firewall and associate it with it. So to do that, we run neutron firewall create, and we pass in the policy. So what this does is this applies a firewall to the router, and uh, the, the default since we don't have any rules in that firewall policy, by default everything is going to be dropped. So logically, what we have is we have a router that's deployed, and then we have a firewall that's on top of it that's blocking all access from everything behind it. So if you run that uh, same curl command to access your web servers, you'll see that that'll no longer work. And the reason for that is we haven't added any rules into the firewall to allow that to work. So our next step is going to be to create a rule that allows our uh, TCP uh, traffic to work again. So we're going to go ahead and uh, create the rule. Um, so firewalls are, have a little bit, are a little nicer to work with than security groups. They're allowed uh, to basically specify allow and deny actions. Uh, security groups are basically just like a pinhole, which you allow, you specify what you're allowed to go through. So with firewalls, you can say, I'd like to allow all TCP traffic except for TCP 80. Um, but if you're using security profiles to accomplish that, you would have to write your rules in a more complicated way in order to accomplish that. 
So this created a, a firewall rule that allows the protocol uh, TCP and the destination port, uh, port 80. And when things go to that, uh, we, we allow it to go in. And we just call this allow HTTP. Sure, so if you still want to have access uh, to your jump host, you'll also have to create another rule um, that does that. But we, you don't need to do that uh, yet. So I'll just uh, do that for sake of argument. Um, allow SSH. And then uh, I'll pass it uh, port 22 for the destination port. So we've just created uh, two rules. Um, after creating those rules, we'll need to add those to our uh, default policy in order for them to take effect. So uh, here's our first, first rule that we're going to go ahead and add to allow HTTP. So this inserts that firewall policy. Uh, in, this inserts that firewall rule into the default policy. And if you optionally created that SSH rule, you could uh, insert that as well with allow SSH. So after doing that, you should be able to uh, run that curl command that we were running before to see that uh, you're now able to continue load balancing uh, over your web servers. Sure, when you, cr so what the firewall does is it protects at the router layer, at the logical router. So when you create a firewall policy, that's basically a container that contains rules. And then after we created the policy, we created a firewall and associated it, that policy with it that by default is associated on um, all the routers that your tenants own. So one thing that we're gonna do in the next release is we're gonna work on a uh, API that allows us to have a more flexible uh, ability of where you wanna apply it to, your entry and exit points of your uh, network. Yeah, right now a firewall is global for a tenant and it applies across all of their routers. So after uh, inserting that rule into the policy, you should be able to access everything again. Um, one thing that uh, we did earlier is when we created the load balancer, uh, we associated a health check with it. So what this allows us to do, if one of our instance crashes or gets deleted or dies, um, it allows, it pu uh, we pull that member out of the pool and we uh, take them out of commission. So when you make curl requests, it'll no longer display one of the web servers. So in order to demo that, we'll go ahead and delete one of our web servers. So if you do Nova list, just to show which web servers we have running, then you can uh, just pick one to delete. Uh, and the command is uh, Nova delete, and then you pass in the name of the server you want to delete. So I'll go ahead and uh, delete web server one. So this will go ahead and tear down the box. So after a certain amount of time, when it gets torn down, we'll be able to make requests. And you can see only web server two will respond. You can create multiple firewalls. Um, multiple firewalls? Well, actually, right now, you can only create one firewall. If you create uh, multiple firewalls, it won't do anything for you because it's applied globally for a tenant. So we're, it's uh, something that, just to prove out the API, is something that we have added in the last release just to figure out how we want all the rules to work. But the zoned stuff of how things are applied on the router are not really fleshed out yet. So one thing that we're going to work on is basically to map firewalls to different routers, so it's a lot more flexible and useful than what we have today. So it's there, but it's not really implemented yet. Right, right. Can you repeat that? Uh, 
Uh, it's a question about the scope of the um, scope of the firewall. So you said it's applied at the router. I think you also said it applies to all hosts. Can I just confirm you mean it polices traffic from the outside net to those hosts rather than intra VM traffic? Is right. that still policed by the security group rules? Exactly. So security groups are applied on the tap interfaces of the VM. So that those are applied behind the router. Firewall as a service stuff only applies to the router ports, just on the router. So that won't help you to enforce like uh, intercommunication on the same network. But one thing that we, we could do is we could create like a network for our web servers and a network for our jump host and attach them both to a router. And then you could uh, enforce that cross uh, network communication. So uh, earlier I deleted web server one. Um, so now when I curl to that VIP, you can see uh, web server two is the only thing that is returned. Yep, uh, you can order firewall rules. Um, when you do a uh, neutron uh, firewall, so when you do a new, uh, neutron uh, firewall policy show, this order that's actually returned here is a list. So uh, one thing that you can do is pass in a dash V option, which shows the output and you'll see that uh, the rules that are actually returned is they're in an ordered list. So one functionality that it has, it has a uh, way to insert rules before and after other rules. So if you do neutron, grab on firewall, you can see that uh, it allows you to insert. So if we look at the insert rule command, It has the ability to pass in uh, which rule you want to insert before and which rule you want to insert after. So by default, if you just run it, it'll insert the rule to the end. So if you, if you write rules that need to be in a certain order, uh, this is uh, the way you would put those in that correct order. Um, those are all the steps for the labs, but if you have uh, any questions as you uh, go along, feel free to shout them out or uh, come up um, and uh, ask. Cool. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and leave the labs running for the next 24 hours or so. So if you want to continue playing with them uh, later on, we'll keep those up for you guys as well.
One of the things I showed at the beginning of the presentation uh, was the underlying infrastructure that's running behind this lab, so I'll go ahead and show that again. So uh, one of the things to help operationalize um, the cloud is we have this uh, NSX manager, so that displays uh, everything that we have going. So currently in our, in our cloud, we have almost 5,000 logical networks deployed. So those are basically the, the neutron network, uh, bro uh, uh, layer two broadcast domain, we also have uh, 1,500 routers, so those net that's what those networks are connected to. Um, we have eight gateways. These are basically what allows us to go in and out of our cloud. So these sit at uh, at the edge of the cloud that connects the net that connects our networks uh, out to the physical internet. Um, and he, uh, here is one of the labs, just to, to show you what it looks like uh, in the manager. Um, these are all uh, logical networks and uh, the ports that are on. So as you can see, you can expand this out and see which transport zone that's on it. Uh, one nice thing is uh, in order to debug it from this level, uh, we have uh, tools like port connection. Oops. So uh, I'll drill down into this uh, access lab switch. So uh, on the switch, you can see we have a uh, the, the three ports. Um, it shows us the tr physical uh, transport nodes that they're deployed on. Um, so it allows us to know what virtual machine that, or what hypervisor your, uh, your virtual port is deployed on. So one nice debugging tool is this uh, port connection tool. And this will actually show you uh, how the traffic flows in the physical network. So I'll select uh, which port. So I'll select port one on the switch and then uh, uh, port three on this other switch. So uh, this was, I did it to one of the ports that were off. So you can see that there's no connectivity uh, between that. So I'll go ahead and uh, pick the other port, uh, port two. Oh. And this will go ahead and uh, like draw out the path that it takes in the physical network. So it's a like helpful debugging tool that we use. Yeah, yeah, I think so. One more time, what did I create the public network for? Why did you create it beforehand? Oh, I created the public network beforehand because you need to know the IP addresses that uplink to the public network. So as a normal tenant, this is not something that you'll usually know. Um, so that's why we went ahead and pre-provisioned and created the public network ahead of time. Yep, usually that's uh, how it would work. Um, the admin would go ahead and uh, create the public network, or there could be multiple public networks, and uh, you can uh, choose which uh, routers you need this connect to. Um, Neutron also allow it, it depends on how you want to deploy it. If, uh, if you expose that information to users, then you could allow them to bring their own networks or uh, create it. But for sake of the lab, we pre-created it just to simplify things.
Sure. Um, we actually have uh, the dashboard uh, working uh, here. Uh, we we took it down only for uh, bandwidth uh, concerns. So if you uh, if you take the IP address of your lab and uh, you point your web browser at it, uh, you pass in HTTPS. I don't know. We might have taken it down, but uh, one nice thing to, to use is the is Horizon, which is a UI uh, that helps uh, display all this information. And one uh, cool thing of it is it has a uh, utility that shows what your networks look like visually. So it helps uh, see that visually. Yeah, we don't have time to 